good. <clears throat> All right, hello, and welcome to the uh, ECU Scissortail Creative Writing Festival, our four o'clock session here on Saturday. Uh, my name's uh, Joshua Grosso, and I'm a professor of English here at ECU, and it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Crooker today. Uh, before we get started, uh, let me just remind you that we're doing this through Zoom, and it'll be on YouTube, so uh, even if you don't catch the live performance, it'll be here for posterity, so you can watch it at your convenience, you can share it with people, and you know, get it out to as many people as possible, so that'd be great. Okay, uh, let me just thank a few people before we get started. Uh, obviously, we wanna thank the Oklahoma Arts uh, Council for their support over the years, as well as the Daryl Fisher Lecture and the ECU Foundation for all their support. I uh, also want to thank the English department, of which I'm part of, for supporting this for many, many years, as long as I've been here since 2006 and beyond, as well as the ECU administration for thinking that this is worthwhile. So we appreciate all of you guys. Uh, and of course, thank you to Mike Maxwell and Tiger Media for letting us do it this way, because we don't know how to do it this way, right? We only know how to do it live. So otherwise, it wouldn't happen without them. So this is wonderful. We're trying to be flexible during the pandemic. So I think it's worked great. So and if you haven't seen the other sessions, please see them. They're beautiful. And it's really nice to watch it in the comfort of your own home. OK, well, I guess we'll get started. So let me introduce uh, Barbara Crooker. Uh, Barbara Crooker is a poetry editor for Italia, uh, Italian Americana and the author of nine full books of poetry with Some Glad Morning coming out in the Pitt Poetry Series in 2000, uh, came out in 2019. Her awards include the Yates Society of New York Award, the Thomas Merton Poetry of the Sacred Award, and three Pennsylvania Council of the Arts Creative Writing Fellowships. Her work appears in a variety of journals, so many that I can't even read them all, but this is just a small taste of them. Uh, she appears in the Valparaiso Poetry Review, the Cheriton Poetry Review, Green Mountain Review, Christianity and Literature, the Denver Quarterly, the American Poetry Journal. She's in the Bedford Introduction to Literature, uh, Nasty Women, an unapologetic anthology of subversive verse. And her work has been read on ABC, the BBC, the Writer's Almanac, and has also been featured on Ted Couser's American Life in Poetry. And uh, you can find her works on her website, barbaracrooker.com, as well as her Amazon page. And if you go to the University of Pitt, uh, Pitt Press's, uh, Press's website, they have a poetry series there. And we're going to try to put links for all of those on our YouTube site so you can look at them at your convenience. And today, Barbara is going to be reading from her two books, The Book of Kells and Some Glad Morning. So it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Crooker, and I'm going to disappear and let her take over. Oh, thanks so much. That was a very kind introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, I had my plane ticket to come in person last year, and it was disappointing when it was canceled, but it made sense. I'm thrilled that we're able to do this via the uh, miracle of electronics. And it's I, I wish I could be seeing the audience, but it's, it's really lovely uh, for them to host. And thank you, Ken Hatta, for arranging this. So I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to make this really simple. I'm going to read 20 minutes from one book, 20 minutes from the other book. The two books came together in different ways. So for the book of Kells, and here's the cover, um, I had a writing residency at the um, Tyrone Guthrie Center in Anna Carrig County, Monaghan. And I went with a project in mind that I would do a series of meditations on the book of Kells. Now, I had a book of reproductions, and in case anyone's interested, uh, Trinity College Library has the entire, all of the, the um, illuminations and pages on their website, so you can see them virtually. That's all I thought I was going to see, and then through a lucky accident, um, one of the other uh, fellows at, at the uh, Tyrone Guthrie Center had to go down to Dublin for a funeral, and I tagged along and got to see the actual Book of Kells. You only get to see one page a day, so here's a poem that describes my adventure seeing the, the Book of Kells. The poem is called Trinity College, the Book of Kells on 1019, the page of the day was Portrait of St. John, Folio 291 Verso and 292 Recto. In a dim room, the Gospel of John rises, pure gold in the gloom. 
In the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh. John's seated on a throne of ultramarine haloed in plates of light. He's my tribe, a scribe, notebook in one hand, pen in the other. Around him, tattooed in vellum, interlaced knots, no beginning or end. The more I stare in this darkness, the less I see. Patterns too small for my retina. Uh, these aging eyes, made from pigments of verdigris, orpiment, lamp black, and woad. Is it a vision or merely a dream? Metalwork or woven ribbons, this is the universe recast as pattern, and I draw in a breath, word of God on my tongue. One word you might not have caught, the plates of light, it's, it's P-L-A-I-T, like braids. Okay. Um, so I, I have poems about all the various objects that show up in the illuminations angels, books, um, uh, uh, the hen and the peacocks, and the alphabet and the capital letters. I mean, I just sort of went on and on um, focusing on different things. This one, interlinear, is kind of the doodlings in the corners. Interlinear. Let's Praise the agile little animals that flit here and there in the Vulgate text, who can wedge in small spaces. The moth in initial P, antenna flickering outside the line. Or the monk on his horse trotting right off the page. Look, there's an otter, his mouth full of fish, and here a blue cat sits watchfully by. A gorgeous green lizard slithers in the text, 72 recto, while a wolf pads his way through 76 V. It's a whole barnyard, chickens and mice, hounds and hares, snakes, eagles and stags. Animals as decoration, animals as punctuation, things seen and unseen. So let us praise all of God's creatures, including the small and the inconsequential, all of us interlinear, part of the larger design. And here's the snake. And I'm, I'm reading to you from chilly, rural northeastern Pennsylvania, where I was outside in the garden the other day and nearly stepped on a garter snake. The poor thing was practically frozen and still as a stick, but he was just waiting for the sun to come up. So here's a snake, so here's snake. And the snake shows up in lots of different illustrations. Symbol of the resurrection, slithering and hissing down the page. The monks believed a snake was restored to youth whenever it shed its skin. But then there was the snake in Genesis, the loss of innocence, the great fall, a double-edged sword, a forked tongue. In the book of Kells, some snakes are made out of abstract interlace, while others form complete borders, serpentine, coiling, interweaving, fretwork, tracery, S. And as I carried on, um, again, writing about different things. Um, I have several poems on pigments and paints and one on ink and one on paper. I decided to that one of the cats wanted to have its own voice. So this is in the voice of the cat in folio 280R. Look at me sitting in green and gold splendor, outlined in red dots, fitting decoration for a royal design. I've no doubt that cats are the finest of God's creations. I have a place of my own on this strong piece of vellum, four lines from the top, the best part of the page. 
My garden's a heaven of strokes in a row made by ink and the sharp teeth of a feather. Mm, birds, so delicious I could eat them for tea. What all these humps mean, I haven't a clue. Perhaps they are mouse holes. I'll sit here and wait. They must be important because I'm here to guard them. Unless, of course, something better comes by, like a butterfly to chase or a nap in the corner. Excuse me, I'm yawning, and there by the fire is a very soft cushion, so tempting. Good night. <laughs> that can't just pet to talk. So I also um, found, um, this is an actual found poem, uh, probably found it on the internet somewhere, of complaints from the medieval scribes. So all of the quotes are actual words that someone transcribed. Imagine sitting for hours at a slant desk, copying on rough parchment with a sharpened quill, day after lonely day. Well, of course you'd be tempted to write in the margins. That's a hard page and a weary work to read it. New parchment, new ink. I said, no, I'm sorry, new parchment, bad ink. I say nothing more. The ink is thin. I am very cold. St. Patrick of Armagh, deliver me from writing. Thank God it will soon be dark. Oh, my hand. Now that I've written the whole thing, for Christ's sake, give me a drink. I sort of feel that way at the end of the day sometimes. So half of the book are these reflections on the Book of Kells, and the other half of the book are reflections, uh, are, are more um, notes on being in Ireland, uh, poems on being in Ireland, meditations on being in Ireland. Um, I, I fell in love. I hope that's evident in the poems. And um, it, it was really um, an absolutely magical, I went back twice. It took me two retreats to write this book. So here is this one. Um, you know, in the United States, we think that the moon, there's either the face of the man in the moon or the green cheese. But in Ireland, it's a hare or a rabbit that they see in the moon. Ireland. A brown hare washes her face in the lane while the hare in the moon looks on. The hare in the moon carries an egg, a new cycle of life that comes in the spring. But now it's autumn, the sky closing in, fir trees inking footprints on the gray silk sky, a luminous sky tattered with crows. Two swans, ruffled lilies float in the lake's bright bowl. Some fairies touched all the trees overnight, turned them orange, yellow, and red. All of the green fields are clotted with sheep. What is this world but the body of God? And I think one of my tags fell off. Let me see if I can find this poem. Um, it is here. Okay. So another thing that I fell in love with, you have them in the Western part of the United States, I think magpies, but we don't have them in the East. And there's an old nursery rhyme about the magpies, how one is for sorrow, two is for joy, three is for girl, four is a boy. And it goes on until I think it's seven is the number that's never been told. So I had that in the back of my mind when I was working on this. Magpies. Magpie on the lawn and I am transfixed by its exotic look. Stark black and white feathers, Jutting tail, it's struck like a peacock on the glittering gl grass that spills a handful of emeralds before him. One is for sorrow, the old nursery rhyme goes, and I look for a partner, hoping for joy. Oily feathers gloss purple and green, snowy shoulders, chest and wingtips, motley and pied. He doesn't need the rest of the spectrum, the gaudy rainbows, pennants, and flags. He knows the world is black and white. See him swoop, 
searching for treasure, bottle caps, gum wrappers, pennies, the glitter the rest of the world discards. This gray day brightens because of his antics and look, here comes Joy winging to join him just when I thought it was no longer possible. And I fell in love with uh, different parts of um, the, that was um, fauna, different animals and birds and the flora. Uh, gorse, traveling north from Dublin, both sides of the highway roll out in every shade of green, all along the berm or flush against stone walls, the bright splash of daffodils. On barren hillsides, the gorse is in bloom, firs covering the heap, a heap of gold. After the billow and build of storm clouds, lightning's piercing needles, the tumult and cadence of the rain, perhaps this then is rainbow's end. Not glittering treasure, a hoard of coins, but instead thorny bushes growing where nothing else can flourish, blooming for all they're worth just because they can. And in line four, furs is F-U-R-Z-E. That's just another word for gorse. For the writers, the creative writers uh, in the class that, that's watching this, I mean, this is how you can get your material. Um, it's not all what you know, it's what you can look up online. And the whole world is there at our fingertips. Um, another plant that I fell in love with was Crocosmia. And I was able to actually buy some. I haven't noticed outside of it's come back again, but I've planted it in my garden here. And last year it was starting to spread. Crocosmia. We saw them everywhere in the west of Ireland. Showy spikes of red, gold, red, orange flowers, grass like leaves, gladiolus, more demure cousin. But glads are flirty debutantes, rainbow colored ruffles galore, while Crocosmia are plain half slips sticking to their side of the color wheel, red, orange, yellow. What they lack in variety, they make up in reliability, tough enough to survive Irish winters. Corms that can weather the cold. Graceful arches with catalog names like Irish Sunset, Irish Dawn, Copper Tips, Falling Stars. Come spring, they'll ignite their green fire. Praise the power of the small and hardy the resurrection rising out of duff and detritus. Watch their slow, small fires burn. So something as innocuous as a, um, as a, um, a, a seed catalog is material for you. Um, I didn't think I'd have time to read a longer poem, but I think I do. So um, I'm going to read Another challenge I set myself out to do while I was there, and I will offer this up to you, the creative writing students, was to try some poems in form or to work on poems in form. And having a long residency is a wonderful way to be able to do this. I wanted to challenge myself with this kind of obscure 16th century Spanish form called the glosa. So to write a glosa, and you can look this up online, you take a quatrain from somebody else. Each of those four lines becomes the end line of a 10 line stanza. But wait, there's more. So that line, the 10th line, has to rhyme with line nine and line six, just you know, to be challenging. And also, I want, decided that I should be using Irish writers while I was in Ireland. So this is called for Jerry. It's in memory of my late friend, Jerry Rosenzweig. And I'm using four, a quatrain from Seamus Heaney, the door was open and the house was dark. The door was open and the house was dark. Wherefore I called his name, although I knew the answer this time would be silence that kept me standing, listening while it grew. I open my email, find a post from you, except it's signed by your younger son, Paul. He said, suddenly and unexpectedly, you were gone and I became a flame filled by a gust of wind. 
You and I exchanged every poem written in the past 40 years, every mark we made on paper, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we used to joke. But now there's no inbox where you've gone, no note that I can start. The door was open and the house was dark. My heart is heavy and the screen is black. A finish something new, a bulb that shoots a stalk, then the green fire of leaves, tongued flame of blossom, all the more striking against the snow. I never send out a poem until you take a look, make comments. Loverly, can you lose this line? But now there's no reply. I could hit send, pretend that it'd go through, Wherefore, I called your name, although I knew. In the middle of a friendship, who thinks of endings? Each poem of yours made me look forward to the next. They journeyed back to Ireland, your family, the buttons on your father's coat, your mother's kettle, the birds whistling in hedgerows and lanes. Your address remains in my contact list, plain evidence of your existence. Denial says you're busy or away, not checking mail. I compose a long letter, subject, catching up, press, enter. Believe in this pretense. The answer this time would be silence. How can you be gone? And so abruptly, okay, you smoke, so what? Your life was rich with family, grandkids, poems, the manuscript unfinished, submissions in the mail. So many strings untied. How you loved summer, hated it when days drew short, the shadows longer. Once you wrote about a long gone lily that, like Orpheus, came back from the dead. From bare ground, unexpected bloom, it returned. Could you? I'm left standing, listening while it grew. So I want all of you creative writing students to go find four lines and write your own blow up. Okay. Okay. So um, it's Easter. This is Easter Sunday, 2016. And I think this, this little narrative will be self-evident as um, it unfolds in the poem. It's, it was the centenary of the uprising. So on the centenary of the uprising, we tour a Georgian house, Florence Court, home of the Earls of Enniskillen, part of the Protestant ascendancy. We're Americans, don't understand the significance of this date. Instead, we take it all in, Palladian windows, Baroque plasterwork, ornate silver service, hand-painted porcelain. Downstairs in the servants' quarters, the wine cellar housing hundreds of bottles, the room set aside for polishing, another room just for China, a staff of 24 for this small family. Servants were invisible, had to scuffle down cold corridors with coal scuttles. Heavy trays of food entered the dining room from behind an oriental screen. In the hall, the omnipresent bells still waiting to be rung. Later, we read the Irish Times, saw snapshots of Dublin, parents bringing their children to the general post office where you can still feel the bullet holes. This is not the 4th of July, no fireworks, barbecues, marching bands, just a nation sobered by the civil war that followed, the streets of blood where Yeats wrote, a terrible beauty is born. We leave in a downpour and then the sun comes out. An unironic rainbow, translucent and fragile, follows us on a road that had been cratered and bombed during the troubles, but is now paved over, smooth macadam, all the way home. And I'll end from the Book of Kells with a, a short poem about the real reason I went back to the Tyrone Guthrie Center twice, which was that at 11 o'clock in the morning, hot scones were served on the breakfast table. Morning tea. I came downstairs for Lavinia's scones, butter ready from the oven, crusty and cratered, awaiting their dollop of jam. 
The morning clouds had whipped themselves up to a billow, mounds of soft cream. The plink plink song of a chaffinch dotted the air like currents. Daffodils, pats of butter on thin stems did their little dance and the edible world spread its feast before me on the fresh green tablecloth. Oh, how delicious, this sweet Irish spring. So thank you for coming to Ireland with me. Now I'm going to read from Some Glad Morning, my book in the Pitt Poetry Series, which I'm so thrilled that Pitt asked me for a manuscript and then published the book. Um, this, is the, this is the first poem in the book, Big Love. I've been traveling and missed this spring's shy unfolding. So when I returned, it was if, as if a magician had walked around the yard with a glossy black wand. Pow, lilacs, purple, white, wine colored, sent to rock you back on your heels. Bam, dogwoods, a cotillion of butterflies on bare black branches. Shazam, peonies exploding, great bombshells of fragrance and silk. Ta-da, a rainbow row of irises, blossoms shooting from green stalks, azaleas, rhododendrons. Everywhere I look, the yard is ready to send its bombs bursting in air. So push down the plunger, let every twig and stem erupt into flowers. Soon it will be June and all of this opulence will be spent confetti littering the lawn. I'm standing here slack jawed and gobsmacked, shell shocked into love. Out by the bird bath, one by one, the poppies slip their green pods, slowly detonate into silent flame. So it snowed here two days ago, so I'm looking forward to that. I hope it won't be too long. Spring has been kind of reluctant here. Regret. Nothing. Not those years when you were a single mother, baloney casserole, and not enough money for heat. Or the years before, the ones spent trying to please a man who couldn't be happy, no matter how hard you tried to replicate his mother's recipes. Marinara wasn't sweet enough. The lasagna didn't have enough layers. Don't regret the years that went up in smoke the glamour of the lit match, the first drag, the curls that rose to decorate the ceiling, or the years as a waitress, the customers who stiffed you on tips, which were quarters and nickels back then, every thin dime counting. Instead, remember your friends, those hours on the telephone, the artery of the long black cord, a river of voice. Don't tell me that the broken places make you stronger, and I won't mention silver linings. Sometimes there are scars. Sometimes it rains. Stop looking for the friends who aren't here, the ones whose faces you sometimes glimpse in a crowd. The past is the grass growing under our feet, the dirt beneath it, what feeds it. Remember that nothing is ever lost. And when you're a writer, nothing is ever lost. It can show up in a poem. I don't know if I need to explain that, that telephones used to be connected to the wall with a curly black cord. And sometimes you had long cords, so you could take it in another room, close the door behind you and get a little privacy. Um, it's a different world here. And I, I do have a poem that I'm not gonna read to you today that um, is basically an ode to the port to the manual typewriter, which nobody knows what that is or how to use it. And if you do know how to you do know anything about typewriter keys, you've probably seen them as earrings. Okay, well, I'm not reading that poem today, but I am reading this one. Recipe. Lately, I've been feeling like I have no idea how to write a poem. That it's something I've never done before, and I don't know how to begin. So I turned to the Betty Crocker cookbook. The more ingredients you add, 
the less sure you'll be about the eventual outcome. It could be a botch. It could be unforgettable. What I'd like for you, dear reader, is that you could slurp this poem with a spoon, noting its elusive use of spices, how there's always something you can't quite identify, how it's more than the sum of its parts, that heat and time are part of the equation. Michelangelo said, I am still learning, and now I'm back in kindergarten, pinching pots out of clay. If you think everything is under control, you're not driving fast enough, says Mario Andretti. And there I am, driver's training, hands at 10 and 2, terrified of merging onto the four lane. I'm here to stop your heart, says Rothko. And that's what I'm aiming for, even though most days nothing I write would stop a toddler on a trike, let alone traffic. Rumi thought the wound is the place where light enters you. Well, I want to be the knife that cuts you open. So is there anything in this recipe you think you can replicate? No? Then go shopping in the grocery aisle of your own experience. Drive your own fast car. Maybe someday you'll write something urgent and necessary as the yellow light of butter sinking fast on rye toast, an inexplicable miracle. Perhaps my claim to fame is that I once ran into Mario Andretti at the ABE, that's the Allentown Bethlehem International, Eastern International Airport, and he was a really nice guy. Okay, so then the segue is this next poem is called Butter. I have to, to tell you that what I'm describing in the first six or seven lines no longer exists because Land Lake took the kneeling woman off their box. So in some ways, maybe this poem no longer makes sense. I'll let you be the judge. I use um, a quote from Fernand Poit, a French chef, butter, give me butter, always butter. Kneeling on green grass beside the still blue water, an Indian maiden, or should I say Native American woman or first person holds out a yellow box of butter as if it were treasure. And she's also on the box, which turns her into one of those endlessly repeating images in a convex mirror beloved by Renaissance painters. Behind her, there's a large red O, the sun also rising. Even the sky is pale yellow, thick as Irish cream. In this, this the age of low-fat cholesterol watching, butter has been shunned. We've forgotten the pleasure of a single pat turning liquid, a golden lake atop a small hill of mashed potatoes, the gilding of a slice of raisin toast, or the slow sinking into the crevices of a Thomas's muffin. During the war, butter was rationed. My mother bought oleomargarine, which came in white blocks. We helped her knead in the dot of red dye, which restored it to, it to dairiness. Let us imagine it might have come from a cow, not a chemist. Now we live in a time of plenty where supermarkets are fully stocked. Can't imagine lining up for hours only to find that there's nothing left, that no matter how many dollars you have, it's not enough. There's nothing to buy. And yet we know, or we should know, what's coming as we ignore the warnings about climate change, drowned cities, crop failures, scarcities. Somewhere in the future, a small girl will unearth this box as she sifts through garbage, searching for treasure. She will sound out the word with something like wonder. She will ponder sweet, cream, salted, Try to imagine the taste, something rare and wonderful from the world that disappeared. I happen in this book to have mm, not one, but two poems that are odes to the martini. And I, of course, did extensive research on the martini. And one thing that I came up with was this terrific quote from H.L. Mencken that the dry martini 
which is the title of the poem, is the only American invention as perfect as a sonnet. And that's the epigraph. So of course I had to write a sonnet. The cold shimmer of a glass of gin kissed with vermouth. Or as Noel Coward said, waved in the general direction of Italy. E.B. White called it the elixir of quietude. Louis Bignel, a reverie in a bar. Let the molecules lie sensuously, calm on top of one another, stirred and not shaken, wrote Somerset Mom. Let's not forget the olives, groups of three, sinking beneath the horizon of the glassy sea. It might sound good later today. So this is a sort of a change of pace. Um, some A few years ago, I was asked to write a poem for an anthology. Usually anthologies collect work that's already been written and appeared in a journal, but this was writing the poem directly for the anthology. And what you were supposed to do was compose a still life, take a photo of it on your phone, then write the poem about your photo. Well, I, I liked the idea, but I wasn't getting anywhere. And we were in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and suddenly I saw something which I said, this is it. Let's just stand here for a couple of minutes. My still life is going to compose itself. So the title of the poem, this is an ekphrastic poem. That's just a fancy word that means a poem that has a conversation with a work of art, usually a painting. Another writing tip that you might want to try. And the painting is The Ball du Moulin de la Galette by Pierre Lustre Noir. Jostled and elbowed at the Musée d'Orsay by people clicking, first at each painting, then at its attribution, I start to realize no one's looking at the canvases, just their screens. And so my nature more composes itself as I wait by the leather banquettes for a few still minutes until a flock of cell phone users settles like a pigeons on a park bench, more interested in checking messages and posting on Facebook than watching Renoir's dancers whirling and dipping, light and shade stippling their stiff dresses, their serge suits, their rosy skin. Here in Montmartre, on a Sunday afternoon, the hall is bathed in sun, filtering through the trees, dappling the woman in the blue and white striped dress, the men with their straw boaters. Even the glasses on the table ring with song. But on this Sunday afternoon in the museum, none of this registers. Hunched over, waiting for the ping of incoming, faces laved in pixelated light, drawn to the world of two dimensions, thumbs are the only thing moving. A faint hint of batter sizzling in butter enters the room along with distant phrases of accordion music. You can almost hear the turtle doves twitter and tweet in the far off trees. And the one tiny thing perhaps I should have explained is that nature, more dead nature, is the French word for still life. Okay, so switching gears again, I like to kind of flip, and forth, flip back and forth on topics and different subjects. There's nothing you can't write about. This is a poem about a BLT. And the quote that I'm using as an epigraph was by Warren Zevon, talking with David Letterman about his terminal lung cancer shortly before his death. And his quote is, enjoy every sandwich. Here's how to make a great sandwich. Country white bread, lightly toasted, contoured with mayonnaise, leaf lettuce spilling over the borders, overlays of tomatoes, train tracks of bacon leading straight out of town. No need for roadmaps, potato chips, or pickles. Yes, winter is waiting just over the horizon, but right now I'm gonna sit in the sun and listen to birdsong. I'm gonna eat every crumb, every plottable coordinate now while I can. I do write a lot about food and here's another one, useful. I want to be useful, 
like a spoon is useful for ferrying a mouthful of soup, warming the belly on a winter night. I want to be useful as a hook is to an eye closing the waistband's gate. I want to be agile as a shoelace that threads the aglets ending in a double knotted bow, a seam that runs along the cell hole from disparate parts. The marriage of oil to vinegar, red to gold, unctuous to bitter, so much more together than when they were apart. I want to be the whisk that joins them, an emulsifier. I want to be as useful as a hundred watt bulb brightening the room, a drink of cold water running from the tap, essential as electricity powering tools. In a world that seems poised for disaster, where what we've taken for granted no longer seems given, I want to be a nail, a screw, a brad, a fastener, something that holds things together, even as it's all about to fall apart. And just a couple of more to end the program. So the, the final quarter of the book um, it is set at a different residency that I had at the Moulin à Nef in Ovilar, France. Um, and it, this was, I had been there twice also. My book, Les Fauves, was largely composed there. So just a quarter of this book um, I composed on the second trip. Um, I had a terrible pinched nerve. And here's a poem about that. There's actually two poems about that because it was the central part of that stay there. Pinch nerve, happiness, the 10 short minutes when the scream of pain in my hip subsides. Here in a corner of Southwest France, ginkgos spread their golden fans. There's a drift of dried leaves and wood smoke, a chittering in the trees. The gravel path is dotted with chestnuts, glossy as the coat of a roan colt. Comfort in the curve of my hand. I'm careful not to trip as I walk back to my studio in this village of honeyed stone. An ankle sprain would be more than I could bear. Nearby, the green garonne murmurs and chuckles as it runs to the sea. Take the pain with you, I beg of the water. It just shrugs and keeps on going. Petite Marie, my epigraph is, this was a small statue on a back road above the village. Petite Marie, full of grace, you stand in the midst of a harvested field, stubble at your feet. Holy Mother, glazed in ceramic, your robes are the same blue-green of La Ecajon, the color of shutters and doors. Your bare feet rest on a stone. Behind you, sunlight dips the leaves in precious metals, copper and bronze. Your eyes are cast down, hands folded, lips closed. Nearby in a neighboring tillage, someone in a sunlit vineyard is turning the blood of ordinary grapes into wine. And I'll close with Tutti Frutti. I always wanted to work Little Richard into a poem. Tutti Frutti, all fruits, what my mouth never knew it desired. I can hear Little Richard scream, Tutti Frutti, oh Rudy, a wop ba ba a lot bam boom. And I am back on the hardwood gym floor with my girlfriends clustered in knots, boys on one side, girls on the other, no man's land in between. Both sides ache for someone to ask them to dance, but no one wants to take the first step, afraid of enemy fire. And here is this bread, Tutti Frutti, found at a farm stand in Valence d'Ajon. Clusters of dried fruit, apricots, golden raisins, figs, craisins, chunks of hazelnuts, the perfect partnership when toasted for a slab of foie gras its richness melting in the heat, a dance of unctuousness and crunch. Oh, Rudy, so many years of heartache and yearning, but now my mouth full of pleasure and decadence, finally, I am in love. Thank you all so much for being here this afternoon and for listening, thank you. 
All right. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so we, we have just a few very positive comments, as, as you, you'll you see soon. And there'll probably be a lot more as people start watching this and viewing this, right? So just yeah. to kind of, just to talk to you for a minute before before we let you go. Uh, I just had a, I was at a question and interest, uh, especially with your first uh, book, The Book of Kells. Uh, I've read a lot of books of poetry and fiction that become enamored of a place. And it becomes like a travelogue. But what I like about your book is it's much more than a travelogue. It's like a meditation on all yeah. things Ireland, the culture, the yeah. history, the poets. It's just, it really speaks of Ireland. And I just wondered, because you also mentioned how the Irish see a hare in the moon rather than the man in the moon or cheese. And I wonder, from your experience in Ireland, what do you think, uh, how can I say this? How do the Irish look at the world in a different way that's maybe inspired you as a poet? What do they see when they look mm. at the world that maybe we don't see in something that maybe helped you as a poet or maybe captivated you and made you want to write about it so much? Well, that's a really good comment and question. I think um, probably that what struck me the most is the sense of place and locale that, that everyone is rooted where they grew up. And the, the sense of being Irish also that extends, there's, there are more Irish living in America than they are in Ireland because of the, the grass, big waves of immigration because of the famine. And so they, they, they consider themselves Irish. They're all Irish, no matter where they are. And it was an interesting comment that they asked me, um, so where, where are your forebears from? The, the sense that you had to come from Ireland to be Irish. And I said, well, half of mine are Italian, half of mine are Scottish from the Olive Sky, and they said, or the Olive Lewis, rather, that's near Olive Sky. And they said, well, but that's the Outer Hebrides. That's in Ireland, you're Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but it's part of, I think, my own discipline and practice of poetry is paying attention to things, to small things, to everyday things, to where you are. And so, you know, while I was there, I just really wanted to immerse myself in what was before me, the landscape, the flowers, the animals that I saw, the, the Irish hair is different than our cottontails. And, you know, I, I started doing research on them and I spent a lot of time doing things that never show up in poems. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of research behind the poems that never make it into the poems. But that's okay. I, I love doing it. And I really was in love with that work that I was doing there. Every day I get up, I just couldn't wait to start writing. Oh, that's interesting because yeah, I like the idea that so much of what you research and learn didn't make it into a poem. Right. So I, I just wonder maybe for some of our students out there, how much do you have to like research to really uh, to write a book or even to write a poem? Because a lot of people would say, you know, I don't like to research. I just want to write about my feelings. How much how much do you have to be a scholar to also be a poet, I guess? Well, I think you should be accurate about the things you're writing about. So, for example, if I decided to stick a flower into a poem, I would want to look up and make sure it should be blooming at the time of year that the poem was being written. I mean, there's nothing that makes me crazier than seeing plants and animals that don't belong in the landscape of, of the setting of the poem. I think you can do as much or as little research as you're interested in. I mean, I have a, a huge body of ekphrastic work of poetry about paintings, and I just love all the research I do, which is probably another word for wasting time. <laughs> and not writing, it's reading about things that you might want to write about, but I really love doing it. And so so that is part of what I'm doing. I'm in love with what I'm doing. And I hope that that gets conveyed to the reader. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that, I think that's important because a lot of our students don't often always want to read and study. They just want to get to the writing. And I think it's so important mm -hmm. that they both really inform each other, like you're saying. And yes. scholarship and research is a kind of traveling, too. We all love to travel. That's another kind of traveling. And I think that's what yes. makes your poems seem like so adventurous because you're always going somewhere in them. I think that's really I was I always going somewhere <laughs> before the world changed. Right. Um, but the other part of reading is reading other people's writing, mm -hmm. other poets. You, you have to be if you're going to be a, a poet, right? If you're going to write poetry, you should be reading I'm going to say four or five times as much as you're writing. It, you know, I, reading is, is the key to being a writer. Um, even reading things you're not especially interested in sometimes. Uh, reading, writing, reading writers whose work is vastly different from yours and not the way you want to write, but what can you learn from that? 
And another way of learning about writing is writing reviews. Oh. It would be, all these be wonderful to encourage students to write reviews and post them. That's, that's because a great you, point. Yeah. You do analyze uh, work in a different way when you're writing a review of it. Oh, oh that, that's great. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. And I, I just wonder, curiously, since you've written so much and you have such a career, uh, what was your first published poem? Um, you mean the name of it? or what, yeah, Like, what was it? Where did you publish it? Just anything. If you can remember, what was the first work where you're like, oh, my gosh, it got published? Well, I mean, I published in my student um, um, magazine as an undergraduate. So that's probably it. I don't think there were any publications for children when I was growing up, although there are right. good things right now. So probably that was it there. Um, I think my first professional publication was a journal called P capital P O E M, which I think is even still running. Um, I think. Cool. Wow. But uh, I started publishing in the late seventies but there's a poem in my first book called 25 Years of Rejection Slips. It took me a long time to get that first book of poems yep. published. I mean, it's a very competitive field and there are tons of wonderful writers writing. And I kind of thought that first book might be posthumous. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was very happy when it was posthumous. Right. Yeah. And I really pretty much never dreamed that I'd have nine books. Yeah. That's yeah. Oh, it's a major accomplishment. Cool. Yeah, oh, I just I love you. to hear how people's publishing stories start. And I'm I'm glad you said that. There's, you know, every poem is built on a, you know, a mountain of rejection. We don't and tell absolutely. that story as much, but it's it's true, definitely. But it's completely true. And why did I keep going? I think because I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> Monet said there's painting and gardening, and that's all I know how to do. And I'm substitute writing and gardening, and I don't know how to do anything else. So that's yeah, I just kept going because I didn't know how to stop. Yeah, okay. Well, it doesn't <laughs> seem like that's true from your poetry. And I'm just wondering, do you, do you cook yourself? Are you a, a, a home chef? or? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, or again, in before times, mm -hmm. because I'm currently taking care of my husband who's been at home after five months in the hospital with multiple things wrong with him. And so there's not a lot of time in the day right now. I'm doing very easy things. Well, you'll have to do it through your poetry now. I'll have to do it through the poetry and I hope to, you know, return to cooking at some point. I just wondered because, I mean, you write, I mean, a lot of people write about food, but I mean, you write about food really well. You, were, you oh, write about you. it with the eye of a chef because you, you yes. care about ingredients. It just, it just, it, I've never, I've, I don't think I've ever heard poems that connect so well to food and the art yeah. of cookery, the way oh. your poems did. They, I'm very hungry right yeah. now. Thank I can't you. wait to go home and cook. Well, they all do. want everybody in the back room where I'm trying to tell them to be quiet. I don't want to eat, but I, I think it's because I like to eat, not that I like to cook. I got you. If you like to eat, you need to cook for yourself. Um, right. You know, I think uh, I think everyone should know how to roast a good chicken, for example. But that should be part of the curriculum. <laughs> and then how to turn it into soup afterwards. Oh, yeah. Because why waste things? Right. Which it, it sort of relates to writing. I always tell students when I'm in my revision process and I'm cutting out lines that don't work in the poem, the poem is better if you cut those lines out, but I save them and try to reuse them. You know, kind of like making using leftovers and putting some gravy on them in another in a new poem. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But I don't throw things away that I still really like. Oh, that's smart. And, and just one final question to kind of uh, end. I just wonder, you write about things that to me are very meaningful. This, these small things, whether it's noticing a certain flower or cooking or a BLT. Some people might say, you know, in these troubled times with all these tumultuous events coming uh, going on, you know, why aren't you being more political? Why would you write about a BLT when we can write about some this or that? What would you say is the value of doing like of writing about small domestic things or like Jane Austen used to say, just working on your uh, what did she say? Like, I like to paint my little uh, spot of ivory. Right. What's the what what makes it what makes these things still relevant and beautiful in times where everything seems so just epic and catastrophic? Well, I mean, I actually have those poems as well. Right, I'm sure and I, but I try to I'm really feeling that some of what I'm writing is is I would call it lyrical political hybrids. Mm. So poems that start in the lyrical, but they go off into political areas. 
So I think we have just have to be engaged with the world. Right. Engaged with our world. There is a poem. I'm not sure what page it's on. You know, obviously the poems in the book were written um, um, eh, three to five years before the book came out. But this poem on page eight ends, stanza one ends somewhere. There's a nasty little bi- virus about to go airborne. How did I write that? Why did I write that? I have <laughs> I have no idea where that came from, but it seems very scary to read that now and in the middle of a poem about um, peonies and some other things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all there. The world is there for you to write about. Um, engage yourself with it and write about it would be my my mantra, say. Great. Well, well, thank you for not only sharing your poems, but your insights. I mean, uh, it inspired me and I'm sure it's going to inspire a lot of our viewers. Well, um, I'll just close by saying thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, and I can't imagine you didn't, uh, please share it with other people. Share it on Facebook. Share it on Instagram and Twitter. Tell people about it because we want as many people to see this as possible. Uh, we do have another uh, session at 6 o'clock, so please tune in. And I just want to thank Barbara again. Thank you so much for spending time with us. and I really appreciate it. Thank you again for having me. You're, you're my, my pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for watching, guys. Well, we hope to see you at 6. Thank you. Yep.